We, we, we did make a mistake and uh, we put our hands up. We forgot the importance of social care and we had uh, phone calls and uh, phone calls. No, no, they're very, very uh, generous about uh, our misgivings there. Um, we would love to integrate health with social care because actually we hear in the news a lot about how patients are not able to move out of hospital systems in, into care homes and care sectors and actually be cared for in the community. And so social care is a very, very important aspect of the integrated health and social care agenda. So handing over now. Hi, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, I, I think it's great to be on the agenda. Um, it's a really, really important thing that we've got to get right um, as we go forward with, the, with both the NHS and local authorities. Um, and I want to use the opportunity to talk a little bit today about why it's important and hopefully get some understanding with you as a community about what social care means. Um, and we're going to talk about Michael and what his journey is going to be like after social care. But also we're going to talk about something we're actually putting together right now um, in NHS Digital and how that's been derived from working very closely with local authorities and hospitals and uh, representative bodies to say, actually, what can we do in this space? What is really going to be able to make a difference? Um, I've come this morning, I was talking to 150 corporate directors of finance across local authorities. So there's a really important piece about benefits, which I know um, you heard about this morning. And I'm going to say a bit more about that because it's critical in these conversations that we really understand the value of what we're doing and how it works across the system. And it's not just about getting patients out of hospitals. It's about keeping them out of hospitals. And that, that movement and how we manage that movement can make all the difference from somebody getting out and coming back in for a week's time and ending up with a lifetime of high cost social care. And it's those things where we really make the difference. So I'm talking about Programme 15. It's part of the NIB. I'm sure you've heard about that over the last couple of days. Um, we do have an adult remit, so we're not covering children yet. Uh, maybe we'll get to that one day. Um, we're very benefits led. We're not starting with what's available from a technical solution. We're starting with what's the problem and what are the benefits in us coming in at a national level and fixing something and fixing it so everybody can use it and use it locally flexibly. Uh, we're focusing on information sharing, but that's not the only thing. Um, uh, and today we're talking very much around what Amir touched on was about the transfer out of hospital, but not what you're thinking about. It's not about the medical discharge. It's about the processes that have to happen legally before you can even talk about discharging somebody. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, this is a really useful map that documents the majority of the information flows between social care and health. And it's fair to say that the vast majority of those have no standards or information about them. And we're working through those with our colleagues at the Local Government Association, with the PRSB, um, with as many people as we can in local areas to understand where we've got a role nationally and where we can add the most value. We've done the assessment, discharge and withdrawal process, which I'm going to talk a bit more about. Uh, we're looking right now at the medical discharge. Uh, we're going to start looking at some of those really outside the system things, not about necessarily care, uh, but around uh, deprivation of liberties. Those are blockers. About how we actually find out who's going to be, how the care, phone, care home is only going to receive its money. About how patient transportation works to get people out of hospital. Because they're the space where we're hearing time and time again from people we're talking with locally, they're the blockers. I should also mention we've looked at things which aren't going to be viable. We've looked at continuity of care within social care and we've looked at adult social care referrals. And whilst there's a, there's a space there you could fill, we don't see any benefit of a national solution. And that's about failing fast and under, really understanding what the customer wants. Um, so there's a really big goal for what we're doing and this is where we have to fill. Local areas are looking together with their NHS partners and local authorities about how they can integrate their systems. Um, but they're all doing it themselves and they're doing it in isolation. We know that we've got the mesh, we know that we've got a, a national infrastructure and what we're trying to do is think about where we can make exploit that national in, infrastructure to actually support integration and interoperability really works well there. Um, so that's where we're looking at. The green is where the market is really around integration. It's all about one local authority and one trust and we're trying to look at the middle section and this is really exciting because because we don't live in boundaries, we all know that. 
the fact of the matter is you may fall over on holiday in Eastbourne, uh, but you live in Oxford. And that process of being discharged from somewhere in Eastbourne, um, I think it's in Hastings actually, the hospital, I can't remember quite, um, and getting to, to Oxford involves all those information flows, ordering the transportation, letting the social care department know that you might need help. And those are really key things that are really simple to, to, to change if we knew what to do and we could uh, um, improve the benefit of them. Okay, I said I'd get to Michael. This is what we're going to talk about today. It's the assessment, discharge and withdrawal process. This is a change. Legally, if you're a clinician and you want to discharge someone from hospital and you think they need a social care assessment, you're not, you're not, you're not qualified to do a full one, but you think there's something, something's required, you have to tell the local authority that they need one. You have to have received confirmation that they've um, received it before you can discharge them. So this is what we've been doing. So uh, that's what happens for Michael. He needs to go home. He's, he's in Eastbourne, he's fallen over, and he needs to go back to, uh, to Oxford. And the, the, the member of staff has to do the ADW process. Um, that's being done by paper. Um, it's involving a number of areas. Uh, they might not know what his local authority is at the moment. Um, they might have to contact lots of people. And what we've been trying to find is the space there where you can fill a national standard and a conformance product that will help it. Um, we've done this in partnership with Islington with a local solution. And our national solution builds on that extensively and, and takes it up a level, ensuring that it makes a difference for all. And that's it in a nutshell. Um, we're using the secure email to transform that information flow from the hospital to the local authority and back again. I'm not going to go too much into that. It's really simple, but it's not happening right now. And if we can get that happening nationally, we know that we can make a really big difference to the care of that patient. And, and the, I should, sorry, I should always get my terminology right, we have patients and uh, citizens and service users. Um, that version uses CDA. The national solution is going to use fire. So looking at my time. OK, um, nothing really more to add from that. That is uh, a document talking about what's happening. Hospital rights, goes to adult social care reads. Um, adult social care rights, back to hospitals to read. So I won't dwell on this for too long. Um, we are going to use the mesh, uh, and that's an amazing national asset, as we all know. Um, it allows us to do that cross-boundary flow, and that's, that's the real prize for us. In the longer term, we think we can do something special with the NHS number and verification, which gives us further to go with the release versions and adds actually more value to both the local authority receiving the information and the trust. Um, but version one won't do that, but we know it's, it's viable going forward. Um, as we talked about, this is being set up to fire. That was a change we made about uh, eight months ago. I'm really glad we did it. Um, I think it will really pave the way for going forward when we come to talk about implementation and deployment. Um, we have designed, and this is really important and comes back to that, that place for national role, is that we've come up with a minimum, minimum standard. Um, and, and that means that whatever state you're in and whatever you want to do locally, we know that what we've put in place as a standard is what everybody has to do. Now, some places might want to add something, some additional information, like they might want to send a specific document, or they might want to include the carer's phone number, or they might want to talk about the uh, 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 voluntary so sector organisation the person's working with. That's all down to local discretion, but the products we're building allow that flexibility and local use, and I think that's an important concept to keep, keep with, um, because it's about change across the whole of the country and even if that's a small one we know that that will make a difference and then it's about local customization going forward. Um, we are aiming to make sure NHS Digital supports that national change uh, but then to support local areas whether that's through the trust and the local authority or a partnership or through the suppliers we haven't come quite get, got that bit right yet um, to actually get, get that working. Underneath that and underpinning it, we've got a form service. Um, that will actually support the message going into the, the spine and output again. But at a very minimum, we know that we're going to use that form service to, to be sent by uh, electronic mail uh, or secure email if both parties can use it. Um, and that's going to be something that's going to be on the system. And again, comes back to being able to be uh, utilised and uh, used flexibly locally. Um, 
I think some of the things we've, we've talked about, um, compliance is a big issue. This does allow local authorities and trusts to be compliant with the CARE Act, and that's a really important, important point. I've already talked about flexibility and the other issues. So, Coming back to my conversation with finance directors this morning, um, it was interesting because the presentation that started uh, the morning off was one about um, robots in social care and trials that we're doing across the country and, uh, and uh, the world. And it's really, when we come back to my presentation, which is talking about one information flow and one piece of information, it seemed relatively low scale. But I had to say to them, if somebody comes to you with a business case around robots in care homes, please throw it away. Because you know, we're years off of understanding how a robot can really make a difference within a care home. Um, and it's those type of things you've got to worry about. So that's the type of market that we're working with. The conversations about digital maturity in local government, whilst they're mature in, in some spaces of digital, like car parking and actually waste collection, is an amazingly logistic feat in terms of where those, uh, how, the, how the dustbins get around it, 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 and efficiently as possible. But for, for social care and care, we're, we're, we're quite behind the curve and we're not managing the market and it's, it's a really difficult place to be. So being able to talk to people who make financial decisions about what they're going to get out of this is really important. Um, and I must admit, it also helps with um, national business cases as well, because of recent experience. So I wanted to reflect on some of the things that we found out working with Hertfordshire, working with um, Islington and Cumbria uh, and other areas. Um, a, there's efficiencies. That makes sense to all of us. We know we're not using paper. That's great. Um, we know it's compliant with the CARE Act, there's a benefit in that. We know uh, that, as you'd expect, there's an impact on delayed transfers of care. But some of the other stuff's really interesting, and it's really where you get to really understand why social care is important to health and why social care is important to the direction of travel uh, for the NHS. So, A, improved ability for the hospital to cope with demand. Makes sense too. Improved patient experience, reduced median length of stay. Now, that's focusing on the cost of keeping the patient in-house. But what does that mean? OK, you, you get out of hospital quicker. Um, you reduce, you're reducing also your 30-day readmission. Again, another cost which is affecting both social care and health. Now, these ones I've talked about, we're reasonably confident we're just going to be able to put this in there and get them out. Where we go next, we have, we've got to see it on the ground and we've got to go, go get it working. But we think they're there. So, rate of hospital acquired uh, infection. Again, coming back to that, what happens to that person experience? Can you even discharge them in the first place? Um, and where this comes down to is that we really believe that this process will really start to have an impact on long-term conditions and preventing them. Um, and that is where the savings across the whole system will really matter. And you always need to give a figure, and we've got those figures, which is amazing. Uh, team have been working both in partnership with Hertfordshire um, and centrally to put this together. And I'm really confident about saying these figures, which is great. Um, they're not huge, um, but the cost of implementing isn't huge either, but it can make a difference. So we're thinking that if a local area manages to implement this, and so that's basically uh, across a, 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 um, uh, somewhere like Hertfordshire, which is where we've done it, uh, we're thinking this is going to save around £300,000 a year. But that's an ongoing saving. And it doesn't include those long-term costs we're talking about. And being to ha able to have that conversation with people at a local level is really important. Now, we're quite used to working with the NHS and, and who we have to get through to, talk, to make decisions. When you're working in a local authority, you have to work with councillors who make decisions. Our councillors are amazing people. They spend a lot of time dedicated to it. But their day jobs are far from what you and I do in some cases. And you need to be able to translate what you're doing into a way that makes sense to them. Because the very next thing on the agenda when you're saying, please put £100,000 into this IT system, is shall we shut the playground? Shall we shut the library? And that's where these figures are important. So we need to go back to first base all the time. Why are we doing what we're doing? And how is it going to add value? OK, I'm sorry. Now, just to make it real, I'm going to introduce Keith. Keith is an actual social worker. Um, and he's working in the program and has been working with the program for a long time. Um, and I think that, again, brings back to what we're talking to you about. He's not going to talk to you about social work, but you know, there you go. Keith. Thank you. Actually, Amir said to me at uh, lunchtime, 
you really need to get the energy going in the afternoon. You know, it's sort of the graveyard slot. And he said, throw an apple into the audience. I said, listen, mate, I'm a social worker. They're going to throw it back. <laughs> OK, so James has spoken about some of the work we've been doing with uh, local authorities, particularly, and our health colleagues. I'm going to focus very much on, well, I think the first slide actually talks about adult social care in its entirety. And I like this slide. It, like most of my slides, it's not mine. It's from Skills for Care. I think it's the most recent sort of summary of the adult social care workforce in England. Just England and just adults, not children. So as you can see, and I must admit, every time I see this, I'm, I'm, I'm staggered by the, the size of it. And this is just adults, remember. But what stands out, of course, I think, is the independent se sector jobs. You can see it there, one, two, one, five. And uh, there's local authority there as well. But it's really something to think about when we're talking about interoperability. And if we're talking about interoperability, we need to be aware of these figures and who we uh, need to bring in. One of the best things of my job at the moment is working with care home national leads and, and care home people across the country, as well as other independent care sector. And this gives another summary from the same um, skills for care state of adult social, uh, adult social care uh, and workforce in England. And this, again here, we have uh, care homes without nursing, residential 11,600, care homes with nursing 4,600, and not forgetting uh, non-residential care services, such as domiciliary care, which uh, we see with Michael later is a very um, com important component of the care that he receives. I like this slide. I hope you can see it. Actually, I'll come over this way and talk to some of you. Um, uh, what is amazing about this, and when I speak to some of the care home leads, is um, just to focus on what a residential care manager's job might be. Just how much we have to deal with so many different things. And that's also when you have to also um, have a, a relationship with the Care Quality Commission, environmental health, health and safety, etc. Um, I hope you can see some of those, but clearly so many areas to share information. Uh, I, I think a fact is that 60% of care homes are less than 20 beds. So we're talking about very small organisations. Uh, which, of course, relates to other small organisations across health and social care. I'm going to stay over here. I'm going to keep walking back and forwards. Um, OK, information sharing with care homes. Uh, care home, one, east of England, but really it could have been anywhere. Uh, I went to see this home. It was the first care home to be um, actually um, rated as outstanding by the Care Quality Commission. I will say a little bit why. Absolutely superb home. Uh, they turned the hallways into streets. The residents there were all part of that. Many of, it was a nursing home, many have dementia. But just the way they sort of personalised the whole approach, absolutely superb. Best story there was there's a guy there who used to be a postman and they put a post box in the street and they put letters every day and he used to go and um, take the letters out every day and hand them out. Absolutely superb home. Really, uh, so I went down to see the staff in the room, not the owner who knows a lot about IT, but the manager and deputy manager, and I said, you know, what a great home, but I, we talked about information sharing. I said IG, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, information technology, oh, no thanks. Or well, how do you get information from the hospital? Oh, I, we've got a fax over there. I bet you get too many of those. Oh, no, they said. I said, excellent. I oh, know they post it. Um, the medical, so medical discharge summary is posted. Some time receives a week. And if you think about the, the, you know, the targets that we have around 24 hours to get the medical discharge out to GPs, quite rightly, um, you know, it's probably more important, isn't it, that a resident going back to a nursing home actually receives that information because the resident goes back to the nursing home, perhaps, rather than the GP surgery. Nope. Oh, there you go. Uh, another home, um, again, could have been anywhere. Uh, this was more about the fact that a person was moving to a new care home. Um, really, the information wasn't exchanged. Uh, it, and basically, I think... What you can read there, it was um, distressing clearly for the patient, but it's also what came through was there was a very distressing for the staff, um, the way things happened, and not really the way we want it to happen, is it? And the final one, uh, which I realise isn't always the easiest to see, because it's at, I'm doing it again at the bottom. Um, this is, I was on a care home hackathon um, in Liverpool, and it took me two days to work out what a hackathon was, and I'm still not sure. Um, but I, I met a really wonderful uh, deputy manager of a home for people, um, neuro neurological problems under 65. And she was saying to me that she was liaising with the hospital. I'm not blaming hospital staff, by the way, I'm just I'm feeding back. Um, that she was talking to hospital staff and the discharge summary arranged three weeks later and it turned out that the patient had MRSA. Um, so you can imagine the care home had not been aware. 
that was just, um, as I said, I just wanted to feed that back. So the care homes views, and working with the care home leads, I often say I feel like the monkey to their organ grinders, and uh, they never ever say anything other to that when I say it to them. Um, so this is very much their view. Um, the first bullet point there is, of course, about uh, national investment in social care, but I'm not going to talk about that today, really. But this is what they would probably want me to say, if I know they would want me to say. They want to be part of local interoperability plans. Um, very, very important for them. You know, please don't leave them out for, for those from localities here. I, I, Ian Turner, who's chair of the Registered Nursing Home Association, is frequently saying to me the holy grail for them is to see GP data about their residents with their residents' consent or their representatives. Um, the other thing they talk about as well is that cross-boundary flow. Uh, we talked about the importance of sharing information across boundaries to support local working. Well, it's true of care homes as well. And the potential of NHS Mail just to get away from the uh, posting and faxing would seem to be a very good idea, wouldn't it? And then some of the collaborative tools that come with it around Skype you know, um, actually helps us perhaps stop thinking about something like that as just an email to a desktop, but what, and the other possibilities of that and raising the maturity model and learn lessons from elsewhere and community pharmacy makes an awful lot of sense because you know it's not so far removed from care homes and they're actually supporting um, a lot of the work we're doing because they see the need and they get it. Um, again going back to where uh, James started about some of the work that's taking place with the NIB, yes social care is in that and so are care homes. Uh, there's a piece of work that we're doing at the moment with care homes about IG and cyber security which is very important for us to, to, to make sure that information is being shared, whether using NHS mail in any other way, um, and to establish um, secure transport mechanisms. So there's three projects that are really taking place at the moment, which I think are all really independent. Uh, the first one is about the, um, the sector-led IG guidance, and that's one of the things that we're taking forward with the sector. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so positive about working with them, although clearly we can only work within um, timescales in these areas. Uh, number two is the NHS mail uh, potential rollout and making sure that the foundations are in place for that to potentially move ahead. And uh, the information sharing between hospitals and care homes, which I'll speak about more now and bring in Michael. I've got six minutes and 20 seconds left. Excellent. OK. So this is one of the things I wanted to highlight, and I come over here again, is that the transfers of care, so we're not talking now about transfers of care from hospital to local authorities. James spoke about that procedure and how that works with the assessment, discharge and withdrawal notices. That's very much between, and nurses fill those in, so not so much the doctors, the nurses will fill those in and it will be sent to the local authority under the CARE Act. This is the medical discharge summary. And this is the, the, some of the wording in the new NHS standard contract. I'm not making any comments about that. I'm no expert. But one thing it does say in there, thinking about someone like Michael, is that the medical discharge summary is made available to Michael, his GP, and any re relevant third party or, or, or provider of health and social care, which could include care homes and domiciliary care by the most appropriate transport mechanism. And I'm pleased to say that my colleagues on the PRSB, I'm on the PRSB as one of the social care leads, uh, actually now taking forward a piece of work with uh, NHS Digital and others to actually just look at what um, is the need for care homes. Of course, it just may not be about the medical discharge summary, but it seems not a bad place to start as we have a standard for it and so much work has gone into it over the years. So, Michael, he's back at home with his domiciliary care and for those of those that aren't familiar with that, and I'm sure there's some and I can understand it, that's really those who give care in the home. Um, and ideally, and being absolutely aspirational where we want to go with this, is that with, with Michael's consent, his care is up-to-date information, which may well include medication, whether Michael has just come out of hospital or more routinely on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd like to think this would also apply to carers in care homes. Going back to when I was a social worker, I'm all too aware that, say, if Michael deteriorated and went into hospital uh, a kind of an emergency, um, the home carer would continue going round to see him, and if he wasn't informed by the hospital uh, with just a telephone number, you see, it doesn't have to be that difficult, a telephone number to let him know, he would carry on, go round there, he wouldn't get an answer, he'd break down the door. I don't think Michael would feel great about that. I also think about end of life, when perhaps the home carer wouldn't be told about end of life preferences, even though they may well be one of the, the services going in towards the end for personal care, etc. And if they don't know that information, then, you know, clearly it may well be them calling the ambulance because they didn't know that 
Michael had other um, views about what he wanted to do. So I'd just like to finish by saying, yes, of course, one joined up system. That's what Michael would want. And why would we think you know, that anything else is there is you know, where we're going? So um, thank you.